top secret document describing a 1958 United States Air Force program to build an underground base on the moon was redacted right after the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik program. The Lunar Expedition Base has its objective manned exploration of the moon with the first manned landing and return in late 1967. This one achievement, if accomplished before the USSR, will serve to demonstrate conclusively that this nation possesses the capability to win future competition in technology. No space achievement short of this goal will have equal technological significance, historical impact, or excite the entire world. While NASA would eventually develop its own plan to land a man on the moon, as so eloquently stated in President John F. Kennedy's 1962 We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, the Air Force didn't want to wait for a mere scientific expedition. Instead, they wanted the, quote, strategic high ground, and that meant having a U.S. military station firmly entrenched on the moon, well above its enemies on Earth. Before the Apollo program, a top-secret initiative called the Lunex Project was hatched in the late 1950s. The U.S. Air Force sought to land the first crewed mission on the moon and developed a detailed schedule that would lead to an underground lunar base for 21 astronauts within a decade. The secret Lunex study reflected the Air Force's belief that, quote, the Soviets do not differentiate between military and non-military space systems. They have talked of a peaceful intent of their space program, but there are many pounds of payload in their satellites which cannot be accounted for on the basis of data given out. It should be presumed that this could be military payloads. From 1958 to 1960, the Air Force and industrial partners teamed up to examine the different angles of a lunar expedition, with the first manned landing and return in 1967. It was then determined that the problem of sending men to the moon and the techniques to achieve this goal were, quote, a feasible concept. Moreover, the objective was believed to be attainable earlier, as it was reasonably economical. Soon, the secretive program became a high priority, and a broad technological base was established at the Air Force laboratories. The Lunex project was not a race against the Russians, per se, but primarily a plan to achieve a much-needed strategic high ground. After the launch of Sputnik in late 1957, Industry Air Force teams conducted a series of studies to closely and realistically examine the military potential of space operations. The first study that supported Lunex was Lunar Observatory, a thorough review of a manned intelligence observatory on the lunar surface. A second research endeavor, called Strategic Lunar System, inspected the military applications of such facilities. Both studies unequivocally concluded that the venture was attainable and reliable. A third study, known as Permanent Satellite Base and Logistic, conceptualized the design of a specialized vehicle for a crew of three that would be able to re-enter and consequently carry passengers to and from the natural satellite. This vehicle would be the key item in the transportation system and demanded close attention, especially regarding its weight, as it would determine the necessary size for the boosters. With the objective to land three men on the moon as soon as possible, the due date was fixed for the third quarter of 1967, with the establishment of a lunar expedition by 1968. As the report concluded, quote, completion of this plan will require the development of equipment, materials, and techniques to transport men to and from the lunar surface, and to provide a lunar facility which will allow men to live and work in the extremely harsh lunar environment. The program's most important development would be a vehicle capable of transporting crews and supplies to and from Earth's satellite. The lunar transport would be composed of a space launching system and a payload, either manned or cargo. The manned lunar payload consisted of a re-entry vehicle, a launch stage, and a landing stage. The landing stage, plus the cargo, composed the cargo payload. As for the launching system, it comprised a booster in three stages, which could deliver either payload on a lunar intercept trajectory at escape velocity. Escape velocity was approximately 37,000 feet per second, enough to boost the 134,000-pound manned payload on a trajectory to intercept the moon and reach it in two and a half days. When approaching the moon, the payload would use horizon scanners to reposition to a vertical relative to the locality. The landing stage would then decelerate it for a smooth landing at the pre-selected site, and terminal guidance equipment and a pre-positioned beacon would affect the offset landing. As for launching, the landing stage would serve as a base to impulse the Lunex re-entry vehicle back to the planet. Unmanned tests would need to be carried out beforehand, with automated countdown and launching controlled from Earth. Furthermore, Minor mid-course corrections would ensure re-entry into the atmosphere, such as performing the return trajectory within the available corridor. Otherwise, the vehicle might skip back into space or burn from excess heat. By using aerodynamic braking, the craft could decelerate and land like any other unpowered aircraft due to its lift capability. 
Enough successful unmanned trials had to be completed before rendering the system dependable. In contrast, cargo could be transported similarly, but without the lunar launch stage. The package would weigh the equivalent of the Lunex re-entry vehicle and the launch stage combined. The recovery of a manned re-entry vehicle was set for 1965. The following milestones were to achieve manned circumlunar flight by 1966 and a complete manned lunar landing and return by 1967. The program had an approximate cost of $7.5 billion. If the United States had followed up with Lunex instead of pursuing the Apollo program, they would have built a launch vehicle resembling the shuttle by the end of the 1960s. In addition, the lifting re-entry vehicle, with its solid rocket boosters and LUX LH-2 core, would likely have provided a more stable basis for succeeding manned programs. But it was NASA's civilian enterprise that was favored over the Air Force's military program. Only after Apollo would NASA perform a radical revision of its technique, giving more importance to reusability and efficiency in the space shuttle. Lunex would also have strengthened U.S. military presence in space, even to the extent of changing the course of the Cold War. However, the program was overly optimistic. The booster and vehicle were considerably more advanced than the Apollo's, and the first lunar landing was due soon. But the primary distinction laid in the orbital rendezvous maneuver. Lunex's approach concerned a Mach 35 lifting body spacecraft capable of re-entering and withstanding lunar hibernation for several months between engine restarts. The compound vehicle would even land on the surface in one piece, complete with its entire crew. In contrast, the Apollo involved a separate ascent module, which would leave the command and service modules. The module, with just one astronaut, would then connect with the lunar orbit. Moreover, the Lunex craft required electrostatic gyro platforms, but these weren't fully perfected until late in the 1970s. In addition, it also demanded computer storage data capabilities not yet achieved to this day. As was the case with all other Air Force space projects that involved manned missions, the outbreak of the Vietnam War likely stretched the service's focus, and it's believed that Lunex was eventually cancelled because of this. However, no efforts were in vain, as the top secret report indicated, quote, The entire program as described herein is an integrated program, in that later development tests build on the results of early tests. Most historians agree that President Eisenhower was correct in establishing the National Aeronautics and Space Administration as a civilian agency the same year Lunex was born. Without it, a military-based space program would likely have turned outer space into an open battlefield.